Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome to the uh, July 23rd Muslim Space uh, Khutbah. Uh, Inna alhamdulillah, nahmaduhu wa nista'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min shururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'malina min yahdihi allahu falai mudilla lah wa min yudlilhu falai hadiya lah wa ashadu anna ilaha illa Allah wa ahdahu la sharika lah wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما All praises belong to Allah we praise him and we ask him for forgiveness and for guidance we seek protection in Allah from the malice of our own souls and the evils of our own actions. Whoever Allah guides, no one can lead him or her astray. And whoever leads astray, no one can lead him or her back to the straight path. I bear witness that there is no other deity but Allah by himself, by himself no associates with him. And I bear witness that Muhammad is his slave and his messenger. O you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and do not die except as a Muslim. O you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and always say a word directed towards the truth so that he can make your conduct whole and sound, forgive you for your sins. Whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has attained the highest achievement. This past week was witness to a pretty interesting event. We witnessed a fair amount of media attention to a wealthy individual who built a rocket and was a passenger as it went up into space and back. It was pretty cool on face of it. But didn't this happen decades ago? Anyone remember a guy named John Glenn? There seemed to be a ton of attention paid to this while this was something that was already accomplished a long time ago. Going to space is pretty cool, but it's been done. A rocket that looks interesting, a rocket's a rocket. I'm going to postulate that the slavish attention that, that we saw may have had to do with the fact that this was the richest person on earth doing it this time around. If that's the case, then what's the connection between having a tremendous amount of wealth and the attention paid to that person? Perhaps you don't pay, don't pay attention to that person, but the reporters who work for major news organizations do, and they pay attention to what people want to see. Clicks and likes and views pay the bills. So I guess that people want to pay attention to this event because of that person. So think about the bigger picture. Don't we see this in other areas in the world? We venerate those with financial success in business, in entertainment, in sport, meaning the more financially successful, then we think that they must be smart, smart and good and all of that. But is that really the case? Contrast this with those without wealth. Uh, we were in East Africa earlier this month on safari, and I honestly left feeling a little unsettled. Yes, the animals were amazing, subhanAllah. You know, nature is so cool. You know, it's like, it's cool to me, like space is cool to me. Lions and cheetahs and vultures and baboons and zebras and more elephants than you can count. Giraffes, uh, terrain that changed from a crater formed from a millions year old volcano eruption to the vast and sparse plain of the Serengeti. But at the end of our trip, we visited the island of Zanzibar on the east coast of Africa. It was also beautiful, a beautiful landscape with beaches of white sand and blue water and friendly, smiling, beautiful people. But we were also witness to people without the same ability to reach for and touch the sky like our friend here in the States. We rode over roads with potholes such that it took over an hour to travel 30 miles to the airport. We ate goat with our hands with a local and a broken bench in a makeshift barbecue slash restaurant thing surrounded by flies and debris. We bartered with the teenager in front of his shop while his friend replaced spokes on a bicycle for some money. We turned away street vendors asking us to buy anything from them so they could make a shilling. We endured numerous, I don't have any change, so I'm gonna keep your change, encounters. We walked through a local village where people sell fruits outside their homes, walked in a farmer's market where people were selling beans and peanuts and produce and used shoes and sneakers on sheets on a dusty ground. What I'm getting to is I personally felt 
the contrast between how things are here in the States and how things are there. And I felt uncomfortable with this disparity. To be fair, I was a tourist in that country and I only saw a portion of their country for a short period of time. So I have a skewed view. And I admit I may be projecting my biases in what I saw, but the point remains. Why is there a lack of potable safe drinking water in that place in, in today's world? Why was that road to the airport so poorly kept? Why was our hired boat worker on our evening Dow cruise tell us his goal was to get to America? The whole thing just felt a little bit off to me. And again, I have no idea if people are happy with how things are there or not, but I do know that I observed a great contrast between here and there. Now, of course, we have the same contrast here, the richest person on the planet in the same country where people can't afford insulin for their diabetes. We're not immune here to the unequal spread of wealth. What I'm getting to is I'm talking about the vast concentration of wealth. We see this at the personnel level with this, where this rich fellow goes into space and we celebrate it. And then even at the country level, we see the disparity. Yesterday I took an Uber and the driver turned out to be an Iraqi refugee who broke down crying while driving me saying Eid Mubarak. You know, he hasn't seen his parents, his eight siblings, his 25 nieces and nephews in 10 years. You know, he left the country when his dad told him, go, take your family and go. There is no future for them here. At least they have a chance there. And that's just one guy. So when thinking about this, you know, what insights can we glean from the Quran about this matter of a concentration of wealth and this uneven spread of wealth? And we'll talk about that in the second part. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ولسائر المسلمين فاستغفروه إنه هو الغفور الرحيم. I say the saying of mine and I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and for the rest of the Muslims who ask Allah for His forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وصلى الله عليه وسلم. In the name of Allah, all exaltations to Allah and peace and blessings be upon the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In Surah 102, Surah Takathur, we read in the beginning, al hakumat Takathur, translated variously and by Muhammad Khattab, Mustafa Khattab, competition for more gains diverts you from Allah. According to Qurtubi, Vying for increase and worldly gain distracts us from obedience to Allah and from remembering the hereafter. Again, in Surah 104, Surah Humaza, Allah tells us, quote, Woe to every backbiter, slanderer, who amasses wealth greedily and counts it repeatedly, unquote. Relatedly, elsewhere in the Quran, Allah tells us, quote, let not the life of this, let not the life of this world delude you. Quote, unquote, meaning in our lives, we are distracted by many things, including the desire for more things and for more money, more wealth. The, the, the delusions also refer to anything that we desire for the gratification of our egos rather than for Allah's sake. According to, the, to a hadith, this also means gathering wealth without right, withholding it from those to whom it rightfully belongs and hoarding it. In another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, the son of Adam says, my wealth, my wealth. But do you get anything from your wealth except what you have eaten and finished? Or what you have closed yourself, clothed yourself with and worn out? Or what you have given as charity or spent? Unquote. What we're reading here, what we're saying, or what I'm saying is that this is a warning and a description about the trap we can all fall into, me and you from time to time, and it's a reminder to be to snap out of it. The Quran is for all time. So we're reading a book that was revealed a, a millennia ago. So hoarding and competing at the expense of dhikr and remembrance and at the expense of other people is something that's been going on from time immemorial. At the end of this surah, we read the last verse. It says, ثُمَّ تُسْأَلُنَّ يَوْمَ إِذَنْ عَنِ النَّعِيمِ and on that day, you will certainly be questioned about your worldly pleasures. So we're going to be questioned about what we've done with all the blessings that Allah has bestowed upon you and me while we're healthy, alive, and vibrant, and even when we're older and wiser. Are we hoarding our, our gifts? If you are if you're someone of means, are you hoarding your wealth? 
If you're someone who has wisdom and knowledge, are you hoarding that? Are you not sharing it and spending it? In another hadith, the Prophet وسلم, is reported to have said to some companions who went out searching for sustenance, quote, by him, in whose my, by him in whose hand lies my soul, you shall be questioned about this blessing on the day of resurrection. Hunger brought you out of your homes, and did you not return before this blessing came to you, unquote. On a related note, if you think about this whole surah in its entirety, it seems like it's a metaphor for our lives encapsulated in eight verses. The first verse, competition for more gains to virtue from Allah until you end up in your graves, but know you will soon come to know, and know you will soon come to know. Indeed, if you were to know your fate with certainty, you would certainly have acted differently, but you will surely see the hell fire. Again, you will surely see it with a certainty, with the eye of certainty, and on that day, you will definitely be questioned about your worldly pleasures. So we have one ayah devoted to how we live, six ayahs devoted to what reality is, and the last ayah devoted to what's going on afterwards. Kind of like our whole life wrapped into eight verses. So what's the way to think about this concentration of wealth and this disparity of wealth? First, remember that Allah created you and me and every human with dignity. In chapter 17, verse 70, Allah, we read, وَلَقَدْ كَرَّمْنَا بَنِي آدَمَ وَحَمَلْنَاهُمْ فِي الْبَرِّ وَالْبَحْرِ وَرَزْرَقْنَاهُمْ مِنَ الطَّيِّبَاتِ وَفَضَّلْنَاهُمْ عَلَى كَثِيرٌ مِمَّا خَلَقْنَا تَفْضِيلًا Indeed, we have dignified the children of Adam, carried them on land and sea, granted them good and lawful provisions, and privileged them far above many of our creatures. So keep this in mind after you leave today. We're all, in, we're all endowed with inherent dignity from the divine. So when we sojourn and travel on this earth and in our lives, consider the other's right to this planet's resources, to a safe land, to clean air, water, and safety from war. Consider what hoarding and the veneration of wealth does. We see it on display daily. We have an unequal distribution of resources such that people are degraded and demeaned and their dignity is stripped and they're reduced to theft and cheating to get by. Whatever gift you and I have is meant to be used in service to others. And by extension, that is service to Allah. From the smallest kindness as described in Surah Ma'un to completely giving oneself in service to others or somewhere in between, that's what our role is meant to be. Consider this hadith from the collection of al nawawi Quote, whoever removes a worldly grief from a believer, Allah will remove from him one of the griefs on the day of judgment. Whoever alleviates the lot of the needy person, Allah will alleviate his lot in this world and next. Whoever shields a Muslim, Allah will shield him in this world and next. Allah will aid a slave of his as long as his slave aids his brother or sister. Whoever follows a path to seek knowledge therein, Allah will make it easier for him or her to have a path to paradise. No people gather together in one of the houses of Allah, reciting the book of Allah and studying it among themselves, but tranquility and peace descends upon them Mercy envelops them and angels surround them and Allah makes mention of them, unquote. So the point is service to others. That is what we're supposed to be doing with our gifts. And again, this is reinforcing the Quran in chapter three, Surah Al-Imran, verse 92. You will never achieve righteousness until you donate some of what you cherish and whatever you give is certainly well known to Allah. So it's important to think about this daily. What am I doing in service to God? What am I doing in service to others? Do I have a gift or a blessing that I can use to benefit others? For some of us, it is money. For others, it's time. For others, it's wisdom, it's wisdom or life experience. We all have something to share. So when we are asked on that day about what we did with it, we can answer, hopefully with confidence, that we used it in, in, in Allah's service. And lastly, to bring it back to the beginning, when we see someone celebrated for reaching and touching the sky, reaching for and touching the sky, think about those who have no choice but to reach downward, scratching the ground for the basic necessities that you and I take for granted. The contrast couldn't be any greater. Reflect on this contrast and make dua for those who can't look up and make dua for yourself. We ask you, Allah, to guide us and protect us from greed. We ask you, Allah, to guide us and protect us from, the, from, the, from desiring to hoard wealth. We ask you, Allah, 
to remind us daily of the blessings you've given us, the blessings of sight, of hearing, of love, of family, of health, and of hope. We thank you, Allah, for the gifts you've given us today, the gifts you gave us yesterday, and the, for the blessings and gifts that you have written for us to the day that our bodies die. We ask you, Allah, the Most High, for your help. We ask you, Allah, the Most High, to help those without access to consistent clean food and water. We ask you, Allah, to provide the strength and resilience for those who have not been able to see their families for years, like that driver yesterday. And we ask you, Allah, to provide us with the strength and the courage to remember you and turn to you when we face tough times. Ameen. Okay, folks, well, um, thank you again for attending today. Uh, announcements for this week, uh, the Muslim Space Community. Uh, remember, tonight is the next set, week seven of the Prophet and I uh, Sira class, uh, hosted by Osama Malik. Usually it starts at six, but today it's going to start at seven o'clock central time. Uh, once you head to the website, muslimspace.org, you can find a link to the class. It's awesome. Uh, it's only an hour and a half. There's a Q&A session at the end. Uh, make sure you register. This is online on Zoom. So again, tonight's session is at 7 p.m. Central Time, but normally it starts at 6 o'clock. All the previous recordings, the past six, are up on the YouTube channel. So go to YouTube, look up Muslim Space, and you'll find it there. There's always uh, weekly uh, office hours with Chaplain Sama. Seven days a week, you can make an appointment. These are any issues at all um, when it comes to faith, life relationships, challenges, and relevance, or your life's relevance to spirituality. Uh, again, uh, The Functioning Muslim, uh, Thursday, July 29th at 7.30 p.m. This is basically a series designed to strengthen your identity. It's for ages 18 to 24. That, again, is on Zoom, so go to the website and check that out. Make sure you register for that. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That's all that's uh, upcoming. Uh, hope you all are doing very well. How's everyone going? 